Welcome. Today I'll be talking about how to create an autopilot test case. Specifically, I'll be talking about how to create and contribute a new autopilot test case to the Ubuntu Touch Core Apps projects. Uh, the Core Apps are written in Qt and QML. However, much of what I'll be talking about today is applicable uh, to writing a autopilot test case in GTK or for another Qt application. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm going to assume that you have already uh, gone through this list of requirements, that you have installed Autopilot, uh, the Beezer's installed, and that you set up your Launchpad account and created one if needed. Uh, if you haven't done those things, go ahead and do so now, and you can follow the, the links there if you need help for setting up your SSH keys. Um, and off the top, we should just mention that as a community, we're here to help, and we are happy to help. Uh, here's some of the different ways you can get in contact with us. Uh, there's some IRC channels listed here for real-time help, and there's some mailing lists. So if you get stuck at any point, um, leave a comment on the video, get in touch with me, get in touch with the other members of the community. We're happy to help you uh, through this process. So first things first. Um, in order to contribute an application, you need to, or contribute a test case for an application, you need to pick an application and a test to contribute. Uh, fortunately, we have a nice handy list here of all the test cases that are needed uh, for each application. Um, if you click on this, it'll take you to a nice little launchpad link, and as you can see, there's plenty of tests to choose from. Uh, for our purposes today, I have chosen two tests, uh, and they're both for the Sudoku game for Ubuntu to Touch. Uh, one is for testing the Best Scores tab, and the second is for testing the Number Entry screen. Um, so with those in hand, uh, you'll want to branch the core app that um, you're interested in. And again, there's a nice handy list up here in case you need to need the uh, launchpad branch information and go ahead and choose your bugs as I've already done and assign yourself to them and to assign yourself you simply click this little icon here add your name search for it assign yourself okay um, again for the purpose of this tutorial we're going to assume that you're familiar with autopilot uh, if you're not Make sure you go ahead and read this recipe that's on developer.ubuntu.com. Very handy. It gives you a nice introduction of what Autopilot is and takes you through a completed test case and a completed application. In addition, there's links to the official documentation and the official tutorial as well for reference if you need. Okay, so now we're talking about writing uh, a test. So as you can see here, Essentially, the first thing to do is to run the application that we're interested in, in this case, Sudoku, and look at the, the features or the tests that we want to write. So I want to write a test for this best scores tab and for the number entry screen. So I'm going to go through and document each step. And essentially, I'm going to talk about what I did, what actions I performed, and then what I expected to see. And we're going to we'll write it down in English and, and uh, if you're like me, you'll go ahead and just write it right inside your editor as well. And then we'll go ahead and fill in the test case utilizing those statements. And we'll have Autopilot perform the actions that we performed and then check using asserts uh, that the results of those actions were the results that we expected and that we experienced. So. I've already uh, checked out the Sudoku app and I'm sitting here in a local directory. So I'm just going to go ahead and execute the application. Using QMLC. Okay, so 
I'm going to go through uh, each of the tests that I want to write. And I'll start with the, the tabs. So if I take a look, I can see that there are several tabs in here, the best scores, the settings, and about everything else. I'm going to go ahead and click on the best scores tab because that's the one I'm interested in. Um, so I've already got my first step, which is to click the best scores tab. Um, taking a look at this page, I can see that it's just a listing of what's going on here. Uh, but I can also see that there's a toolbar, so there's a couple buttons here I can test. There's a button to change the best scores for just me versus all users. And I can see when I do that, that the, the list actually changed, although in this case uh, there's only one score, and that's me. But I can see that the label is changing, and that the list is presumably updating. Okay. So we've already got our action steps, which are to launch the application, switch to the best scores tab, click on each button, and observe that the list updates. Perfect. Now, let's go and talk about the other feature that we want to test, which is testing the number input. So we can see there's a big grid here, and these open squares, in order to play the game, I pick and put in a number and I'm filling out the puzzle. I can see there's a, a little dialog here, and if I click on this number, I would expect it to fill into the square. Sure enough, it does. Um, if I change the number, I would expect it to change. If I clear the number, I expect it to clear. Okay, good. So again, we performed uh, a bunch of actions. Clicking on an empty square, selecting a button, having the button appear, clicking a clear button, having the, the value disappear. So I'm going to go ahead and close the application now and load up my editor. You can see inside my test Sudoku file here, I have exactly what uh, we talked about here, just written in comments. I've got two test cases, one to test the enter and clear number, which is the number input and one to test the best scores tab. Um, and these comments are exactly what we talked about. Clicking a button, finding its value, setting a value, checking the value, everything that we talked about. It's ready and waiting for us to, to put some code into it. Um, before we get too much further in, however, uh, let's talk a little bit about how these files are laid out and what, what the autopilot directory looks like. Um, so you can see I'm, I'm just in test autopilot uh, Sudoku app. And it's important that the layout follows this hierarchy that we're talking about here in order for autopilot to see and, and run your test successfully. Um, so there's a couple folders in here. Uh, one is called emulators. And so autopilot has this idea of an emulator, which is simply a utility class that allows you to have uh, functions, and you, as you can see, you can find more than one that are useful to you for um, testing. So there's a couple here. One's called main window, one's called Ubuntu SDK. And if you take a look at these, uh, we can see there's just some handy functions for uh, Ubuntu SDK applications. Um, things like getting the toolbar button, clicking a toolbar button, opening and closing the toolbar, switching tabs, Lots of good stuff in here. It looks like this will come in handy for us uh, for some of the things that we need to do. And the other one's called main window, which is something specific to uh, our application. Uh, at the moment, nothing is in here. Um, and if we go look in the test folder, we can see that there's an .py file and the test Sudoku file that we have already examined. If we open this uh, init.py file here, you can see that there is some basic setup in here as well to make it easier for us. So we're creating a class called Sudoku Test Class, and we're providing a, a way to make it easier for us to test uh, this QML application. Um, so what you can see here is, is pretty standard for all of the core applications. Um, and 
these utility functions basically just allow you to launch the application locally or installed. Um, you can set the location. In our case, we're going to be developing on a branch, so we're always going to utilize the the, uh, the local install uh, branched application, not an installed version. And it also checks to see if we need to be using a mouse or a, mouse or a touch device, um, so we don't actually have to, to code for both those scenarios. And then finally, our actual test case. Again, we're importing the Sudoku test case class, and you can see anyone who has, has utilized um, uh, X-unit type of, of testing in the past, or has done uh, other forms of Python unit testing. Um, you see the classic setup and teardown, and these two functions will be run before and after setup and teardown. Uh, each each one of our tests, um, each test is defined as a function, and it starts with the word test underscore, and then a descriptive name. Um, each test needs to be standalone, and it will run uh, in random order. So it's important to remember that your tests don't build upon one, one another, or that there's no order, and that whatever setup or teardown steps that you need to do uh, need to happen uh, within the test case itself. Okay, so let's take a look at writing these test cases. Now, because we're looking at cute QML applications, um, we are in luck in that we have a QML file to look at, which gives us the application layout. So if you remember when I launched the application, you can see I pointed out that we have a grid, with buttons, we have buttons in a dialog box here, we have toolbars, um, we've got tabs at the top, all sorts of good things, but we need to understand uh, and let autopilot know what objects these are and, and what to do with them and, and how to interact with them. And so what we're going to do is look and examine the application while it's running. And we can do that utilizing a tool called viz. And so in order to launch the application in a way that allows autopilot to look at it, to introspect what's going on, uh, we can use this autopilot launch command. And you'll notice I also add the dash i here, which just allows us to specify the, the type of introspection needed. In this case, it's Qt because I'm running a Qt application. So we'll launch our application the same way, but this time we'll use the autopilot launch feature. So once again, the application is launched. And now we can call autopilot viz. Select the connection for a cute QML viewer. And you can see we have a tree of all of the stuff that has been loaded. Um, for instance, here's our tabs. It's the main tab, high scores tab, settings, about, etc. If we look at the high scores tab, and I go to the page, we can see there is a header, and there's our text, best scores for all players. So these are the types of, of things and values that we were interested in. Now we should also be able to see uh, some buttons in here. Because we know we have these all in current user buttons. So let's look at the toolbar. There's our back button. There's our all users button. 
and there is our current user button, as you can see. So with that, we have utilized the Viz tool here to take a look and see everything that we need for the best scores uh, test case that we were talking about. We know and can see the toolbar buttons that we need to grab, and we know and see the header label that we need to grab as well. So let's go ahead and close this. Now, because, again, this is a QML application, the layout of the application is also contained within uh, QML files. So in this case, I've opened the, the main QML file, Sudoku app, and you can see here is the layout for the application as well. Um, so we can find those same things that we talked about. Here's each of the tabs. And we were looking at the high scores tab. Here's the high scores tab. Now you'll notice I've added this object name here called high scores tab. And so what this does is it allows us to actually ask autopilot for this specific object during runtime. And so what we want to do is make sure we can access each of the other things that we need to access during runtime by giving them object names as well. So you can see here's the page and here's the toolbar toolbar buttons and we know that we need to get each of these toolbar buttons. So let's assign object names to each of these and call out the all users button and for this button we'll call this the current user button. Okay, so we know that the tab has a name, the high scores tab. So given that an object name, we can now utilize a select single statement, and we'll talk about that and show that in a minute, uh, to, to grab that at runtime. So we know we can issue asserts against that, and we know that when we perform our actions, we can be assured that we're accessing the high scores tab, that we're clicking the button that we want to click, and this other button that we want to click. Now there is one more piece uh, that we haven't talked about, and that's the actual uh, label at the top, the, the, the high score label. And if we scroll down here, we can actually see that as well. There's the header, and I will add an object name here as well. Um, we'll just call it high score label. Okay, so now that we've assigned object names to all of these, we can go ahead and go back to our test and fill this in and start writing a test case to access those objects that we've now defined and to um, tell Autopilot to perform the test case and issue some asserts against those tests. So our first step is to switch to the, the best scores tab. So again, as part of the setup step, you can already see that the application is launched and that we have a simple assert here that grabs the uh, QML view and asks if it's visible, aka okay, has the application loaded, and then has this eventually, um, which will pull and wait until this is actually true. So we'll wait until the uh, application is actually visible before we begin, so the application is loaded and visible. It's part of our setup step. So from there, we can just go ahead and switch to the best scores tab. Now, if you remember, there is some functions, helpful functions in our uh, Ubuntu SDK emulator that can help us here. So if you look, there is a switch tab uh, function here, and it lets me switch to the specified tab number. Um, so we can go ahead and call that here. Switch to tab. And if we remember, that was the first tab. Now, 
we've already kind of thought ahead here and uh, asking for an assert to make sure we're in the right place. So because we gave an object name to that tab, um, we can actually assert that after we tell uh, Autopilot to go ahead and swipe over a tab, uh, we should make sure that we've actually landed on the best scores tab. Um, so we can do that by issuing an assert that the tab name is correct. But before we issue that assert, we should grab the tab name. And you can see here, I've written a, a little bit of code to do just that. So tab name equals get objects tab high scores tab. So this get object function here, it's just issuing a select single for this type name. And if you remember the type from the QML file is tab and the object name is high scores tab. So issue a select for a tab object whose object name is high scores tab. And that's what we've done right here. Then we're going to go ahead and issue an assert that that tab name eventually not equals none. In other words, make sure that the tab name, we get that object. Um, this will fail until we've actually landed on the proper tab. Now finally, you can see that I've added this lambda function here uh, in front of this call. And the reason for that is to take advantage of um, the, the eventually statement. If we left this out, we would have a timing issue of switching to the tab and then having autopilot instantly check to see that, that we were on that tab. Uh, there might be a de uh, slight delay in, in the display and, and whatever else. So to avoid those types of issues, we like to use the eventually command. And by utilizing this Lambda function, we can use the eventually command. And so what will happen is this assert will sit and pull looking for this um, object, a tab object with high scores tab object name um, for a basic timeout. Okay, so now we need to uh, click the buttons that we talked about, the current user button and check the label and then click the all users button. So if you remember again in the Ubuntu SDK, we had uh, some handy things to click toolbar buttons. Um, very handy. So let's go ahead and utilize that and have it click our current user button. Again, there's a bit of code. We are passing the object name that we defined, current user button. And again, this is coming from the QML file where we define object name as current user button and can utilize that function to just go ahead and click it. Now, we want to check the label. So if you'll remember, the, the label said best scores for all players and then best scores for my player name. Uh, when we click the current user button, we expect the, that, that label to change and for the high scores table to update. Um, so you can see I've written a piece of code here to do just that. So we've assigned a, created a variable here called label and we're utilizing the Lambda function again as above and the get object function again. And we're looking for a header called high scores label. Again, that's coming from page QML file where we assign the object name to be high scores label. And specifically, we're going to look at the text property of that. So we've added this dot text on the end. And again, we have an assert that eventually the label not equals best scores for all players, AKA the label has changed. And then finally, the last pieces I'll go ahead and fill in as well. Again, we're going to click the, the all users button, same as above. And then again, we're going to issue an assert, but this time, we're going to make sure that the label actually equals the best scores for all players. And you can see that we're reusing the 
function that we defined up here. Okay, and with that, we should be ready to go ahead and run and see our first test case in action. So let's go back over to the terminal and run our test case. So you can see I'm sitting here at the slash test slash autopilot directory. And at this directory, I can do an autopilot list and it will show the uh, test cases that are available for autopilot. And in this case, uh, I've got some bad indenting. that I need to fix. All right, there we are. Let's try that again. Okay, so we can see our, our one test case here. Now you can type autopilot run, and it will run all of uh, the entire test suite, which in this case is only one test case. So you should see autopilot, yep, and that ran very quickly. <laughs> Let's run it one more time. Essentially what's happening is, uh, as we told Autopilot, Autopilot is going to switch the tabs and it's going to click the buttons and then it's reading that label much faster than we can uh, to make sure that the label is updated. But you can see at the end, we have our RAN1 test in a little over six seconds and everything is okay. That's what you want to see. So now let's talk about the other test case, which is a little more involved. So if we swap back here, we can see um, the, the outline of, of what we wanted to do. Um, essentially, find the first button that has a blank value, as we talked about. Click on it, set a value, um, check that the value works click our button again, click the same spot, clear that value out, and then check the value to make sure it works. Sounds simple, sounds easy enough. Um, let's see what we can do. So the first thing that we need to do is find this button that has a blank value. So in order to do that, again, we can we can utilize the, auto, uh, the autopilot viz tool. Um, so let's go ahead and load it up and take a look. Autopilot launch. Oh, don't forget QML scene. Okay. And we want let's launch autopilot viz as well. So I wanted to take a look at this dialogue as well, so I, I went ahead and loaded that. And I'm guessing it's probably this dialogue right here that I can see. And indeed, please pick a number that seems to match. Uh, but let's go after what we were looking for first, which is the... Um, the grid, and we want to be able to find the, the main button for the grid. Okay, so if I look in the main tab, and I look at the page, I can see we have a Sudoku blocks grid in here, and I can see quick grid and then a whole bunch of buttons and if you'll take a look at our application here you can see that there is some other QML files here uh, one of which is called this Sudoku blocks grid and we can go ahead and take a look at that in just a moment um, which is where all of this stuff is defined. 
So if we click on each one of these buttons, we can look and see they have various bits to them. Some of them are going to have text. This, this one does not. This one also doesn't. This one does. Now, in order to find the blank ones, we can take a look at this enabled property. And you'll notice that the quick text uh, is not enabled for something that's already true. Uh, I should say, already filled in. It's a locked field. We can't edit it. Uh, versus this one, which is blank. And you'll notice that the enabled property is true. So that's going to allow us to take a look and assuming we assign an object name to this grid, uh, we should be able to issue some searches to get down and find all of these uh, cute quick text objects. And specifically, we're going to go after the ones that are true, uh, enabled equals true, meaning we can edit them. Um, and so that will allow us to accomplish our first step, which is find the first button that has a blank value. Uh, we can find all the buttons if we want and then just grab the first one, and that should work fine. Uh, the other piece that we need to understand is this dialog. We need to be able to assign object names to these so that we can click on these buttons. Um, so if you remember, we went and saw this dialog property here in the tree. And sure enough, I can see the text is please pick a number. Um, so let's take a look in here and see what, what's available for us. I can see uh, columns and labels. And I see a grid with a whole bunch of buttons and then two dialog buttons. And let's take a look. We have the text for this. This is the clear button. And I'm guessing these are each one of the number buttons. Sure enough, one, two, three, four, etc. And this is, yep, this is the cancel button. So we have our dialog. Um, now we need to assign uh, and understand, uh, give, give this dialog an object name so that again we can go and look and search for these these quick text buttons and we can search for in this case um, the uh, either assign them an object name or look for the uh, text value that we're after okay so let's go ahead and close this fizz tool and let's go look at that QML file Scroll to the top here, we can take a look. And it has a lot of stuff and functions that we're not necessarily interested in. There's some timers. What we are interested in is this dialogue. And we can see the dialogue here. You can see the definition here for these dialogue buttons. And we can see the number picker buttons. All good stuff. So, with this in mind, let's go ahead and try and start writing our, our test case. Now, so we already talked about finding the first button that has a blank value. And what we want to do is issue a search for all of those uh, Q quick texts that have the enabled equals true property, but first we need to uh, grab and find that uh, Sudoku blocks grid object. Um, so this is an example of a function that maybe we might find useful, um, but it's only it's going to be specific to this application. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense uh, to look for or wish it was in the the SDK. Um, instead, this this makes sense for us to add to our emulator class here specific to our application. So let's go ahead and define a, a function that will give us the uh, blank input values. So I'm just going to call it get blank inputs.
and we shouldn't need to pass anything but self to it. And we're going to go ahead and write our search then for the, the objects starting with the uh, Sudoku block script object and then further refining it to look for the QQuickText uh, objects with the enabled equals true property. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and paste in uh, the notes that I already noticed from running the viz tool, which is namely, here's the object progression as we talked about, having this block grid, having a button, which then has a Q quick text uh, object, which has this enabled equals true property. Um, so let's start at the top. Let's issue a select single for the sudo blocks grid. And we'll assign that to inputs. Then let's go ahead and search just the uh, sudo blocks grid introspect just starting at that base point instead of the, the root node and do a select many um, against these Q quick texts. And you can see that we've specified to look for enabled equals true. Um, and then finally, let's go ahead and return uh, our list. And that will allow us to then grab that first button that we talked about, like so. So we have grid buttons. Uh, I call the get blank inputs function that we just created. And then I just assign the first instance uh, of the grid buttons of the list of all the blank ones to grid button, which we can then uh, utilize um, now we have this note about saving the ID. So the idea is that when we click and interact with this button, uh, we should create a, a function now that will let us actually take a look at what the value is uh, of, the, of the button so that we can issue some asserts against it later. Um, so again, we're going to utilize a, a Lambda function and we can utilize this ID field. So even though we didn't set an object name, uh, specific to this button in the QML file, uh, an ID is randomly assigned at runtime uh, for each object. So, well, that, that doesn't allow us to specifically select it using an object name because we've grabbed a random blank button and we don't care specifically which one we've got. We can just utilize the randomly generated ID for the scope of our test. Um, and again, we're looking at the text uh, property of the object that we're grabbing and I'm going to assign all that to button value and this will allow us to issue asserts against button value later on uh, as we go. So our next step as we've written out is to click that button. Great. We found a blank button. We just want to click it now. So this is, this is relatively straightforward. We utilize uh, autopilot's click, click object uh, function to click on the grid button that we found. Now, we know when we did that, uh, a dialog screen popped up. In order to uh, assure ourselves that uh, we talk about setting a value here next, uh, and that was the next step that we did, but we can take it one step further. We should actually take a look and make sure that that dialog uh, pops up. And we can do that by Uh, adding an assert. So so if we remember when we were looking in the, the viz tree we saw the dialog object and we saw that it uh, was indeed the object uh, that loaded the screen that we were after. Um, but in order for autopilot to see and understand what that object is like what we've done with the previous objects that we wanted, we've assigned a, an object name to it. So it's time to go back to our QML files and take a look and find the dialog. 
uh, and you can see here um, inside the Sudoku blocks grid there is uh, our dialogue that we talked about. Please pick a number. There it is. Uh, right next to all of our buttons. And so let's go ahead and assign a, an object name here. And I'm just going to call it the pick number screen. Well, Now, since we're adding an assert here that, that we can see the screen that, and that it loaded, um, we're going to be checking this multiple times. So this is probably another good example of something that we can put in the main window class. So let's go ahead and define a, a uh, new function in here and we'll call it the uh, get number dialog function. And so it looks something like this. And you can see again, I'm going to issue a select single for a dialog object with the object name of what we just picked. Really straightforward. Now utilizing that, we can come back here and issue an assert that we can actually see the input screen. And so again, we're utilizing Lambda and taking a look and saying that the input screen eventually not equals none. In other words, the input screen object eventually exists, aka it's loaded. Now, for the fun part, we want to actually set a value. We want to click a button. Um, we can click any number button we want. Uh, I happen to like the number four, so I'm, let's, uh, let's click the number four. Um, and again, this is setting a value, we notice that we're clicking these buttons and setting values uh, several times. So again, this is probably something that we can stick inside of our, our main window uh, emulator to make it a little easier for us. Um, so I'm going to assign yet another function and I'm going to call it get dialog button and I'll paste it in here. And the ID idea here is to return a button uh, that I can use to actually punch um, using autopilot and I want to be able to select it in this case um, by a text name. So we're going to utilize our, our get number dialog to get the dialog that we were talking about and then grab the button and we're going to again filter based upon this only the Q quick text within this dialog um, and we're going to grab the ones whose text lines up with the, with the name that I mentioned. Um, in most cases we try and avoid writing selects like this where you're against a label or a text field. Um, however in this case it's a number which should be pretty universal. So it should be okay uh, to actually do it this way. Uh, and the alternative to this of course is assigning an actual object name to, to everything that we want to click and that is also valid and will work. Um, so given this new function, let's go ahead and add something to set a value. And I will again set a value of four because that's the number that I like. And here's the bit of code. So created a variable called dialog button, call their function, it issues that select, filters it down, grabs only that, that quick text name equals four, as we saw in the viz tool. And then I have a simple assert that ensures that I actually got something. Um, this is unnecessary. Uh, if, if this uh, step fails, uh, Autopilot will complain right here, um, saying that it can't click the object. But it's uh, helpful to do it, uh, add the extra assert so that you know exactly what failed and why. Um, so at this point, we should now be able to find a, a button that has a blank value, uh, click on it, load our dialog screen, and click the number four. So let's go ahead and finish this out. 
and I'm going to copy and paste the remainder of the, of the function here and talk about how it works. We needed to add a uh, check to ensure that the value that we chose a four is correct. And if you remember, we added our button value function up here, which allows us to compare the text. Um, and so we want to make sure that it equals four after we click that button. Once that's the case, we click the button again, just like we would as a human. Uh, again, we'll go ahead and check for the input screen just to be sure that we are where we think we are. We will go ahead and look for that clear button and just like the number four button above, we'll click on it, make sure that we get it first by issuing the assert and then click on it. Um, And then finally, we want to check that it worked by adding an assert for an eventually equals blank, aka that the value was cleared. Okay, and with that, we should be ready to run our application and our test case to see everything work. So again, let's go over here and issue an autopilot list so we go up and you can see that we now have two test cases and I'm going to run only the test case that we just ran and you can do that like so so if you don't want to run everything you can run a specific test case uh, as I've shown and let's go ahead and run that So just like we did in the beginning, Autopilot clicks on the blank space, puts in four, checks to make sure that it worked, clicks the clear button, checks to make sure that that worked, and again, we got an OK, which is exactly what we want to see. So now, we've gone from uh, nothing to having two working test cases, and we've closed a couple bugs. So what's next? What do we do from here? Well. We'll want to go ahead and commit our work uh, and as you work on something you, you want to commit it as you go um, you can do that by using the visa commit command um, type in your commit message so saying working test case for input numbers Okay, and you'll get a commit, and then we push. Um, and in this case, you don't want to push back to the, the branch that you checked out from. You want to push to a version under your own name. Uh, and in this case, since I'm actually committing back to the Sudoku app project, uh, I just follow the format of my launchpad ID, followed by the, the project name, followed by whatever branch name I want to give it. So in this case, um, I could call it whatever. Um, I've actually already done this and I can't remember the branch name, so I'm just going to do a beezer push and you'll see that it actually used my save location. So this is where I had saved it. Okay, it pushed up my revision. Now at this point, we can go and over to Launchpad and uh, issue a merge request. And to do that, I can go to my page in Launchpad, go to my code page, and choose the branch that we've been working on. And then I can do a propose for merging. Now, when you do the propose for merging, it's going to look like this. It's going to show already the make sure this target branch is correct. Uh, and because I pushed um, following the format of my launchpad ID slash project name slash branch name, this is already selected. Everything's good to go. I'm going to put a description of the change in here. And you can also uh, add a commit message 
which is required for uh, the core apps, but in general is normally optional. And then hit propose merge. And your merge request will then look something like this. So this is the merge request I actually did for uh, this application. Now for the core apps as well, you're going to have a Jenkins bot which will run it. Uh, and you want this to pass. If so, it will approve. And then once the uh, developers themselves approve, uh, Jenkins will grab it, merge it, and your test case will be in. Now, there's one other important piece to note. You see that the related bugs are linked here. And to do that, you go to the bug in question, you click the link a related branch, and then you can paste in your branch name. So in this case, it's a big long string here. I can go link a related branch, click, click search, and then click on it and it will link. And you can see I've already done that in this case. And so the bugs have these, these nice related branches. And that will actually go ahead and allow uh, the bugs to be updated and to, to track and and ensure that the the work that you've done is is recorded uh, in in the in the bug as well. And that's it. Um, so again, I hope this was helpful to everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, let me know. Uh, you can always find me uh, anything that that you can see on my uh, on my launchpad page here, and Skags. Uh, any of these email addresses, contact the user works, let me know, leave a comment. Thanks.